From the moment Japan set foot in China in the 1930s, it committed countless atrocities. From Nanjing to Wuhan, from monstrous medical experiments to the infamous comfort women, the Chinese endured terrible crimes that still shape relations between their countries today. However, there was one policy that caused more death and suffering than any other. One that is largely unknown in the West. One that the Chinese would give a simple, descriptive name. The Three Alls. Loot All, Burn All, Kill All. Today, on A Day in History, we'll look at where this policy came from and what it meant for its millions of victims. The Second Sino-Japanese War began in 1937 and dovetailed into the wider Second World War. Throughout these conflicts, Japan was known for its excessive brutality, delivered to civilians and soldiers alike of all nations. A Japanese military immersed in ideas of its racial superiority taught to despise so-called weakness in enemies and non-combatants and raised to give complete obedience to their superiors inevitably led to horrors for its enemies. China knew this better than anyone else. The Japanese had been committing massacres and abuses across China from 1937. Tianjin, Beijing, and Shanghai, for example, saw all manner of crimes. Of course, nothing compares to the six weeks of horror unleashed on Nanjing, starting in December 1937, which left hundreds of thousands dead or raped. Into 1938, the Japanese continued this pattern of war crimes. For example, during the Battle of Wuhan, the Japanese authorized hundreds, if not thousands, of gas attacks often on civilians as they fought to capture the city from the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek. However, while the nationalists were the main threat in China, Japan also had to deal with another problem – communists. As we uncover the effects of the Three Alls policy, let's not forget the importance of digital privacy in our lives. Private Internet Access, our sponsor, is an app that offers the world's most transparent VPN service with amazing benefits. A VPN encrypts your internet connection, concealing your IP address and protecting your digital life from prying eyes. Navigating the internet without PIA is like driving in the dark without headlights. Risky and uncertain. Using Wi-Fi at airports, coffee shops, or even at home can leave your data vulnerable. But PIA is more than just a security tunnel with great encryption. It's a key to digital freedom. Want to continue watching the Downton Abbey movie, available only in the USA on your business trip abroad? With PIA, it's solvable with just a click. Break through geo restrictions to access global content, from Netflix shows to live sports events, and get better deals in specific regions, from flights to games. With 91 countries and all 50 US states to choose from, change your IP address and access location-specific content and services. PIA is also one of the few VPNs that support P2P file sharing and has a no-log policy, meaning it doesn't store your data. One PIA subscription covers unlimited devices across all platforms at the same time, securing your whole household. Use our link in the description for an 83% discount, just $2.03 a month, plus four extra months free. With PIA, keep your activities private and secure. It was the struggle of dealing with the communist guerrillas of Mao Zedong in northern China that would lead to the Three Alls policy. Starting in 1938, the Japanese North China Area Army was assigned to contain the communists in the countryside there, while the bulk of Japanese military attention remained on the nationalists. Emperor Hirohito personally signed off on orders to pacify these northern provinces, which gave the soldiers a complete free hand to do whatever they deemed necessary. Orders like this make it hard to draw a clear line between the official Three Oars policy that would come later, and what Japan was already doing in China for years before that. 
Following these orders, the Japanese occupation forces were given permission to loot, burn, and kill anything and anyone in their mission to defeat the communists. They used violence to intimidate villagers accused of helping communists, massacred alleged communist sympathizers, burned homes and villages to stop them helping the guerrillas, and sowed a climate of fear and despair in communist-controlled areas. According to one story, the desperate residents of one village in Hebei province dug a tunnel system to hide from the Japanese during this period of pacification. When the Japanese found out, they tried to flush them out by lighting pigs on fire and releasing them into the tunnels to terrify and burn out the occupants. When that didn't work, one Japanese officer allegedly had the idea of starving them out. He ordered gramophones to be set up to play the sounds of trucks and marching troops, to trick the Chinese into thinking it wasn't safe to come out. That way, the Chinese would be forced to stay hidden until they starved or gave up and came out themselves. It didn't work, but it showed the lengths the Chinese went to to try to escape their occupiers, and the sorts of things the occupiers were willing to do to stamp them out. Despite this harsh policy, the communist guerrillas were a secondary concern for the Japanese, compared to the nationalists throughout 1938 and 39. That changed in August 1940, when the communists launched their largest offensive ever. Across northern China, an estimated 400,000 communist fighters participated in an assault known as the 100 Regiments Offensive. Simultaneously, the guerrillas struck out at Japanese bases, railway lines, coal mines, bridges, and just about anything that might be strategically valuable. The Japanese were taken completely by surprise, and the communists enjoyed remarkable success until October. By that point, the Japanese had managed to organize an effective response, and began to push back the communists, but not before losing around 20,000 soldiers vast amounts of supplies, numerous key installations, and over 600 miles of railway. The 100 Regiments Offensive ended by December 1940, and the Japanese were furious. Major General Ryukichi Tanaka vowed to deliver retribution to the guerrillas, so he drew up a new strategy which he called the Burn to Ash Approach. This was scorched earth at its most extreme. Anything the Japanese could not control would be destroyed to prevent it falling into communist hands. This included anything from food to people to entire villages. It also authorized the elimination of, quote, enemies pretending to be local people, and all males between the ages of 15 and 60 whom we suspect to be enemies. The communists soon gave it its nickname of the three alls. Loot all, burn all, kill all. This was the official start of the three alls policy, but it was little more than a new expression of what the Japanese had already been doing. The policy was put into full effect in 1941 by General Yasuji Okamura. With direct endorsement from Emperor Hirohito himself, Okamura was given full operational control of the North China Area Army, which he would use to systematically destroy the communists across the provinces. Okamura divided the provinces into three categories. The pacified provinces were secure, the unpacified ones wholly in command of the communists, and the semi-pacified ones were contested. Okamura would use a combination of containment and catastrophic violence to pacify all of them. Okamura ordered hundreds of miles of trenches and fortifications to be built to contain the communists within these provinces. These fortifications were supposed to, quote, strengthen the containment of the enemy and destroy his will to continue fighting. All of these fortifications were built by forced Chinese labor, mostly men between the ages of 17 and 40 taken from the surrounding villages. Tens of thousands of them would be worked to death by their uncompromising and unsympathetic Japanese occupiers. Identifying and containing the unpacified provinces was only the beginning. Next came actually pacifying them. 
Loot, burn, and kill was a very literal expression of how the Japanese did this. Japanese soldiers entering a village suspected of communist sympathies would steal food, clothes, fuel, and anything else that might be useful. In some cases, even the houses would be torn down and used as firewood. This worked in two ways, denying these things to the communists while supplying the Japanese with what they needed. Particularly troublesome villages were often burned wholesale. If they were lucky, the residents would flee at the first sight of the Japanese. Those who couldn't flee had a grim fate. In one village, in Hubei for example, 60 people were piled into a house before the Japanese burned them alive. Fighting age men were usually killed on the spot, unless they were needed for forced labor. Women and girls suffered horrific sexual abuse, and many who fell into Japanese hands thanks to the Three Oars policy would join the ranks of the infamous comfort women. In other cases, the Japanese resettled the villages in new collective hamlets, which could be more easily monitored. The Japanese also developed ways to control villages without destroying them. So-called puppet Chinese, those willing to collaborate with the Japanese, could be installed in a village to keep it secure. The Japanese also employed spies to monitor suspect populations that, for one reason or another, weren't simply killed. One former Japanese officer recalled paying spies with opium in exchange for information in occupied territory. These spies and puppet Chinese held the power of life or death over their countrymen, and just one word of accusation against them to the Japanese could have them before a firing squad. But the villages that were looted or relocated were the luckier ones. The guerrilla nature of the communist resistance meant that they could easily hide among the population. To the Japanese, this made anyone a potential enemy and a legitimate target. A soldier named Tominaga Shozo reflected on the attitude he and other Japanese had at that time. Massacres of civilians were routine. They cooperated with the enemy, sheltered them in their houses, and gave them information. We viewed them as the enemy. Collective punishment of whole villages for alleged communist sympathies was widespread. One Japanese colonel operating near an alleged pro-communist village wrote in his diary, the communists give me a headache. Around here, even the women join the war and throw grenades. I have received orders from my superior officer that every person in this place must be killed. The Three Oars policy led to hundreds, if not thousands, of massacres across northern China, as the Japanese took out their anger at the guerrillas on the civilian population. Post-war legal and historical investigations dug up seemingly endless lists of horrendous actions. 400 families massacred together in Hsiang Kuo Chang village in 1943. 128 women and children stabbed or buried alive in Chuan Twen Seng and so on. Uno Shintaro was one of the Japanese officers operating in northern China at the height of the Three Oars policy. Speaking to historians decades after the war, he recalled one typical experience of massacring villages. He was ordered by his superiors to secure a nearby village that was alleged to have communist sympathizers. Shintaro sent a squad in to round up the mayor and eight other leading village figures. They were taken back to the Japanese camp, where they were tortured for information about their alleged communist allies. Shintaro remembered feeling an intense hatred for them. He'd known Japanese soldiers killed by the guerrillas, but he confessed that no matter how many communists or alleged communists he killed, it did not quote even the score. Eventually, Shintaro realized he would get nothing useful from them, so he beheaded the prisoners with his own officer's sword. He had some of his Chinese prisoners dig a grave for the bodies and bury them. We told them not to look, he said, but in a sense, it was better for us if they did. They would realize that if they got out of line, they too might be in danger. Japanese soldiers were taught to be utterly desensitized to this violence. 
When Tominaga Shozo first arrived in China, he recalled his commanding officer ordering all of his men to assemble one morning. 24 Chinese prisoners had been lined up for them. The officer drew his sword and told his men, heads should be cut off like this, before giving them a bloody demonstration. Shozo and the rest of the soldiers were then ordered to practice it themselves. Shozo claimed he was disgusted at the time, but that didn't stop him from marching out, drawing his sword and obeying his orders. This so-called kill drill desensitized recruits to death and showed the utter lack of value that Chinese lives were given by the Japanese forces. It is unknown how many villages were wiped out by this policy, but it was certainly in the hundreds if not the thousands. There are no detailed records, no clear accounting, not even a census to chart more than a fraction of what occurred in northern China in these years. We can only see glimpses, like that given by one British journalist who visited the region in 1945. I visited towns and cities and villages, some of them completely destroyed and flattened. Villages without a living thing, not a living person, not an animal or beast, nothing left, just the hand of death of the villages. The Three Oars policy proved quite successful in dealing with the communists. By the end of 1942, the communists admitted to losing around 200,000 fighters to death, imprisonment or desertion thanks to the policy. Of the 437 counties in northern China, the communists managed to maintain control of just 10 of them in the face of these barbaric methods. China was not alone in its suffering. A very similar policy was implemented in Vietnam during the Japanese occupation there between 1940 and 1945. There, its targets were the communist guerrillas of the Viet Minh, and the methods were indistinguishable. Theft, intimidation, murder and massacres were the instruments of Japanese policy. Japanese authorities seized farmland for their own use, stole cattle and crops to keep them from the communists and even seized ownership of factories and warehouses on the accusation that they were being used to help the guerrillas. As in China, systemic violence against civilians was used to stamp out communist support and spread terror among the people. The crime of aiding the guerrillas was punished with death, usually by firing squad. Even stealing food, which the Japanese widely interpreted as being a way to supply the guerrillas, warranted beheading. Boatmen accused of helping the communists were stabbed with bayonets and their bodies thrown into the river. In the town of Daitu, the mayor who was accused of being a communist ally was arrested, strung up by his heels and disemboweled in public view. Although Vietnam did not officially have a three oars policy, the logic and methods of the Japanese were virtually identical there as it was in northern China, and indeed anywhere the Japanese occupied across Southeast Asia and the Pacific. The Japanese surrender in August 1945 brought an end to the Three Alls policy, but like so many atrocities in history, it did not bring much justice. The Tokyo war crimes trials did not do enough to account for Japanese crimes in China. Later tribunals held in China punished just 500 people and executed just under 200 an inadequate measure of justice to match the litany of crimes committed in eight years of occupation. Among those who escaped punishment was Emperor Hirohito himself, who had personally signed off on the orders but was protected from any post-war consequences by the Americans, who worried that prosecuting him would cause unrest in Japan. The Three Oars policy was thrown into public light in 1957, when a group of veterans came together to publish a scathing book about Japanese war crimes. The book was fiercely attacked by Japanese nationalists and pulled from publication soon after. Study of the policy only resumed towards the end of the 20th century, 
with historians now concluding that some 2.65 million civilians were killed by it. The Three Oars policy is less eye-catching than the atrocities at Nanjing or the experiments of Unit 731. It is certainly less studied, at least in the West, with relatively little scholarly attention devoted to it in English, let alone popular attention. In most histories of the Second World War, it is barely a footnote and even English language histories of the Second Sino-Japanese War rarely devote more than a paragraph or a page to it. Despite being relatively overlooked, the Three Oars policy was one of the most destructive parts of the Japanese occupation of the country. Its legacy is particularly strong in northern China and among the communists who suffered under it. And no small part of the decades-long animosity between Japan and China owes itself to those three simple instructions of loot all, burn all, and kill all. If you're interested in more about Japanese actions during the war, check out our other videos on Unit 731, Comfort Women, and the massacre at Nanjing to understand the true extent of the crimes they committed. In the meantime, help us out by leaving a like on this video and subscribe to keep up with future videos.